and we're so excited to be here. Uh, Michael Redman. Hi, Michael. How's it going? Good to see Hi, you. Chris. Yeah, fine. All right. So, folks, uh, welcome to our longtime viewers. Welcome to folks that are just joining us for the first time. Uh, we're it's, we're pretty thrilled. I think it's safe to say we're we're pretty excited, right, Michael? Yeah. It's uh, <clears throat> we we've been talking about uh, this this book that we've been working on for we've been working on the book for three years. We've been talking about it for about the last year. Uh, and so here's how it's going to go. Um, first of all, thanks uh, to Twitch for hosting us. Uh, and uh, uh, Stephen Hu is producing and he's behind the scenes doing a lot of good work. Um, we're going to chat about the book and uh, take your questions and comments. Uh, and uh, Steve will put, uh, Stephen will put up a link where you can uh, find out all about uh, the AlphaGo to Zero book and you can check it out. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the book. And then uh, there is a poll right now uh, there, of course, uh, this is the fourth anniversary of the historic AlphaGo Lisa Dahl uh, match. Uh, four years ago, we were in Seoul, uh, which would be an interesting place to be at the moment, wouldn't it, Michael? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, everywhere is interesting to be. It's, it's interesting right. in Japan where you are. Uh, D.C., I have to tell you, where I live is in the midst of shutting down. It declared a state of emergency yesterday. So um, it's uh, very good. I hope everybody is staying safe and, and observing all of the things that you are supposed to observe. So be well out there. So we're going to talk about the book, and then uh, you should vote in the poll uh, as to which game you would like to see us comment. Um, I'm going to ask Michael to uh, uh, give us some insights and try and I'm trying to get him to say which his favorite game is, which I think is oh, going to yeah. be difficult because I, I think he actually likes them all. But uh, we'll, we'll I have just... a favorite game. You do have a favorite yeah, game. Yeah, I have a favorite. All right. Well, don't tell them just yet. So <laughs> we'll, we'll have that be a bit of a suspense. But anyway, so you all uh, you all get to pick. So we'll see. You pick. Actually, you pick, and then we'll find out which is his favorite game. So I'm going to ask him to talk about uh, each of the games, uh, the, the sort of the highlights of, of each game. Um, but first, let's uh, let's talk about uh, the book, and then we'll talk some about the the match itself. Um, I have to be real honest with folks. When when we were first asked about doing a book, I, I think it's fair to say that neither of us was that excited about about the idea, right, Michael? Well, you know, making a book is a lot of work. Um, it's not what I'm used to doing, and so I was a bit daunted by the idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I did immediately start. Um, like basically, the most of my part of making a book is annotating the files. So I, I immediately after the match. Um, I was already starting to annotate the files, and that's why uh, there are so many. Um, that's why there are various stages in the level, you might say, or the timing of my comments that are in the game files, uh, because I started um, in 2016, wasn't it? Yes. 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 And I was already adding comments to it. At that time, um, there were no. Uh, Go playing AI, as we say, uh, that we, I could use to study the game with. And so I was doing it all my, on my own and making a lot of guesses. Um, obviously, AlphaGo was stronger than the top human players already. And so there were some things about it that I was having trouble understanding. Yeah. So um, in 2016, and then there were some comments from 2018. Um, when I started to use some computer programs to analyze the game, and I was trying to get some insights about how it might be. And so that slightly changed my comments that are dated for 2018. And then, of course, there were some ca comments that I added just a few days ago, <laughs> <laughs> like uh, probably hours before it was published or something like that. So you, you, He's not kidding. He's not kidding. We literally, we literally... Uh, we're, we're releasing it uh, on, we released it, I'm, I'm very proud to say, on, on the actual fourth anniversary Sunday, and we literally went down to the last minute. This is the great thing about, I have to say, about doing an ebook as opposed to uh, a printed book, is that we could make it, and, and, and we, we, we actually will make more changes uh, as we go along, although I think for the moment we're good. Uh, we, um, but one of the other things that, that we, when we started talking about doing a book, um, was that we really, from the beginning, and, and this stems back, I want to say probably five or six years or maybe longer, I think it was Santa Barbara that you and I had a, 
a chat about you had just started getting into doing online books and you really liked the format. Uh, you can move a lot quicker. Uh, the turnaround time was a lot faster and there was, uh, you, you liked that format uh, better than the, the printed format. And one of the things that we were talking about was the idea of having the playable diagrams, uh, which makes it much easier to play through the variations. Uh, of course, we had the videos uh, from the match. We had uh, the 15 minute, uh, 15 minute uh, uh, analyses that we'd done uh, after the match. And then, uh, and then here's a funny thing. We had completely, well, I say I had completely forgotten about those 90 seconds things that we did Oh, yes. So I think about a week ago, I was talking with somebody from DeepMind, and he sent me to this press site, and I was like, oh, my God, we did these 90, and we, we literally added, they're in the book, but we added those, I think, in the last few days, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was really, so this, the book really gave us a chance to be a multimedia platform, and we have all these wonderful color photos, um, and we really wanted to give readers a bit of a feeling of, of what we experienced when we were when we were at at the at the match and i guess i wanted to kind of set the stage for talking about the games you've done you know you've been a tv commentator on go for many many years you and i have done a number of commentaries before but soul and and this match was like nothing you'd ever done before can you talk a little bit about that yeah well first i'd like to sort of respond to some of your comments there um sure I think that, yeah, I don't recall exactly the time we talked about it, but um, I do think that I was a big fan, actually, of the program, the Smart Go program that was making yes. these books possible. And so, like, they have all these various versions of it for um, iOS and stuff like that. Um, and I was a big fan of the way that it was showing the diagrams. And in Smart Go books, they have the, these um, interactive books that you can do. And I, and I think that this time... Um, I think we were pretty successful in making that um, a more general um, access accessible um, platform, right? Mm -hmm. um, with the EPUBs and stuff. And so it's um, so that's something that I was really interested in. And in response to your ideas about the videos, yeah, it was. I do have a lot of experience, but usually, like um, most of my TV commentaries were done in. Um, studios like in a closed room where I'm doing um, a commentary against a, about a video or sometimes like in the Japanese TV uh, programs there's a game going on in the next room but um, I'm sort of isolated in those right right um, but in the case of the Lisa doll versus uh, AlphaGo match it was I was in this room we were in this room with hundreds of people literally and like uh, I think this the the um, point where it really hit home and um, I really realized it was when after the first game of the match uh, I wanted to go back to my room just to get quiet for a bit I mean and we it was like, impossible we couldn't get was, but also we just have to say I mean we had that first commentary and I may be misremembering wasn't it like six hours long I, I think it was, it was a very long commentary and I wanted to get out of all the noise and excitement <laughs> Uh, just for a few minutes, like we had other stuff that we had scheduled later that night. We had to do the um, the summary of the game and stuff like that. I just wanted to take a short visit to my room and to collect myself. It was impossible to get out of the press room. Right. The right. hallway was packed with uh, sort of frantic people. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. I remember people were just in shock. I remember there were Go players were talking. And the thing is also... Not only could you not get through there, but everybody wanted to talk to us. I mean, you know, I mean, we yeah. just spent all that time. But the other thing about when we were doing the commentary, when I was remembering back on it, was that, uh, you know, we were we did this six or seven hour commentary essentially without breaks. It was real time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we would we would I think there was a couple of, you know, bathroom breaks where we kind of had to sort of sneak out of the set. Um, but it was. You know, it went for a very long time. There were, you know, no, you know, break to eat or, you know, I think they kept bringing us uh, coffee, which we yeah, should coffee. Eat. <laughs> yeah, coffee is okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it was really intense. Uh, and as you're saying, you were, we were doing it in front of this, you know, live audience with hundreds of people, you know, just a few feet away. Um, right. 
you know, why, and, and the other thing is that, you know, this, you're used to commenting games like human players, almost always, you know who they are and you know something about them. And, you know, as people who watch our videos, you know, know, you know something about how they play. You knew how Lee Sedal played, but you had, I don't think you'd really had a chance to, to see AlphaGo before then, right? Right. Well, just the five games that Tom Hui played. Um, but for me, the other thing actually was the audience, because when I have a live audience and I'm talking about Go, usually I have a general idea of, uh, that they're Go players. <laughs> and probably I even know uh, the general idea of how strong they are as Go players. And so I can interact with my audience sometimes. Right. And, um, and I know what to expect them to understand and not to understand. Um, and in Seoul, there was a Korean commentary room where they had all the strong players watching, I think. Uh, they had a lot of newspaper reporters. So all of the local people went to the Korean room, obviously, because they understood the Korean language. And we had uh, reporters from overseas mostly people who were working in um, internet, um, machine learning, stuff like that. They were, uh, or mainline uh, media. So they were not Go players. So, so they didn't understand what I was talking about most of the time. <laughs> I know. And it was very awkward. It was very hard for me to, um, to know what, what kind of a line I wanted to take. And you can see in the first game, if you look at the videos, we are trying to do some stuff for beginners. Um, but Lisa et al. and AlphaGo were playing so quickly that it was um, impossible to keep up after a while, wasn't it? It was It was such a challenge because we had done a lot of talking beforehand about how we wanted to approach this because we knew that we were going to have a global audience and we knew that, to be honest, you know, the majority of that audience would be coming to Go for the very first time and, and would not know how to play the game. And so we really had to constantly sort of, you know, try to keep that audience in mind. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we certainly got a lot of pushback from our core Go audience who did not want to hear basics about, you know, how to play the game. They really wanted to get into the weeds. So we were constantly, you know, trying to straddle that. And, you know, I think in the end, uh, the consensus seemed to be that we, we did manage to find, you know, sort of a, a sweet spot with that. Um, and I feel just, you know, the, the fact that it, and I've told the deep, you know, we, we constantly told the deep mind folks, you know, at the time and since, you know, it brought the game to so many, there's so many people who came to go because of, of watching that, getting their first exposure uh, there uh, as well. So that was tremendously exciting. I mean, we had, you know, people, and, and in the States, you had to stay up late because it was, it was on very late at night uh, back in, in, the, in the States. Uh, yeah, yeah, the time well. difference. So uh, we are going to. It looks like uh, it looks like the, uh, the the crowdsourcing is going for game four. I think that was what I had uh, sort of suspected because, of course, that's the one uh, that Lisa Dahl won. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your favorite game? Because we'll be looking at game four. Uh, but tell us about your favorite game and sort of your thoughts on each of the games before we actually go into the game commentary. And just okay. a reminder to folks: if you do have questions either now or once we get into the commentary. Uh, pop them in there. Stephen will be uh, letting us know, and we'll we'll definitely try and get to as many of those as we can. But uh, your thoughts, Michael? Well, I was going to say game number four also, actually. Oh, good. Uh, all right. That's the all game right. that we said all won. It was the game, um, well, basically, AlphaGo was so strong, and it was always playing in a position, almost always playing in a position where it had already had a lead. Like, it was very quickly taking a slight lead, or at least thought it had a lead, and um, I really wanted to see how AlphaGo would play when it got into trouble. And the problem was it just didn't get into trouble. <laughs> so game four was sort of what I had been waiting for. Um, and it was very interesting. Like it was, it, it reminded me of the Monte Carlo problems that we had with previous programs, but um, they told me that that was not what was happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is a really good question here. It's a big question, so we may have to sort of come back to it uh, several times. But a uh, question about what our thoughts are looking back at this four-year point uh, on the actual match and how AI has changed the games. I will say, uh, check out the book because 
uh, what the approach that we have taken in the in the book is to, as Michael was mentioning earlier, uh, is actually to do that. You know, Michael did commentaries uh, early on, and then you know, uh, it, since it took us three years to work out the various technical issues, um, it actually gave Michael several bites to go back. You know, and as he started using Leela and 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 really. There's, it's. I really love the both the introductions in terms of setting it up, but also the fact that you're able to do commentary on several levels is kind of cool. But what are some sort of general thoughts that you have about where we are now compared to just four years? It seems like yesterday, but also a long time, right? Yes, very much so. Um, I'd say, well, you know, humans um, have been playing Go for um, more than a thousand years at least. Mm. or um, maybe several thousands of years. It could be as long as the Chinese civilization. Mm. And we just don't know how long it is. And for the last several hundreds of years, um, there have been actually professionals, for people who play Go and just play Go for a living, in Japan at least. And there were people like that in Korea and China too. And so the game, the study of the game had been already taken to a very high level. I think it was comparable to what um, computer programs are giving us already. Mm -hmm. um, and we had all this accumulated knowledge of hundreds of years of um, researching openings and joseki, um, opening positions. And some of that was refuted by AlphaGo, and some of it was is continuing to be refuted by what we call Go playing AIs. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to see them refute some of them and then pick up on some other moves uh, that have been played for centuries. Um, and so there are moves that the AIs like and that they don't like. And these uh, scores that the AIs are giving us for various moves are changing the way top players in the world are playing. And then there are some players who resist that. And it's very interesting to see this kind of a battle of wills between players who are playing the AlphaGo, or actually now it's more like Leela or uh, Fine Art and stuff like that, that kind of mm -hmm. program. There's a number of programs that are using the same system. Uh, people who are playing the moves from those programs and the people who like to play their own style after all. There's some top pros who have established a certain style before the computers came. And so they have some of them might have trouble to change and it's very interesting to see them playing their own style against players who are playing the new style that is sort of researched by using computer programs. So we're gonna we're gonna get, go to the game commentary in, in just a minute, but just again, welcome to everybody that's watching, uh, all the folks that are coming to us as new viewers, and and also those of you that are you know longtime viewers, whether you've been watching us on our uh, video series at usgo.org on our uh, YouTube channel. Um, where we've been doing commentaries uh, for for quite a while now, and and this um, this is another really good question actually, which is uh, wondering now this AlphaGo book that we just released on Sunday. This is the first of a four volume series. Uh, we'll be doing the next one. Will be on the Master series. Actually, really looking forward to uh, uh, to working on on that with Michael. Uh, and then the third one is on. Help me out here. I'm blanking for a sec. The uh... that would be the um, okay. So master series is master against human human players, and then there is a set of uh, 50 or so games that are master playing against itself. Right, and then of course we'll wind up with the AlphaGo Zero, which is <laughs> yeah. I and mean, it, it's uh, just to pick up from what I was saying before. It's interesting. To, it's going to be interesting to see how. When Master plays itself, or when AlphaGo Zero plays itself, you can see how it's changed in the way it handles uh, losing positions. Because obviously, if it's playing itself, sometimes it's going to lose, right, half of the time. So, uh, <laughs> um, so you can see it handling difficult positions here, um, and not doing the same thing that happened in Game Four with the match against Lisa. So you can see right. how they changed that, improved right. on it. So it's going to be really interesting. And again, uh, Stephen will put up the link for where you can check out the uh, current book, which is not even a week old at this point. And we'd love to uh, hear people's feedback uh, because I'm sure that will uh, inform how we move forward in this. But the question, and this is a really good question, I think I may know part of the answer. They, they're curious to know whether 
you're, you're thinking about doing other books using AI other than this series. I mean, maybe going back to look at your San Rense book or analyzing this. And this one sounds like you would be interested in it. Uh, and uh, analyzing historical classical games using AI. And I know you've already you've already actually been doing that because you've talked about that in, in some of our uh, some of our YouTube commentaries, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, well, in general, I'm finding that um, the the uh, level of the game is, has been steadily improving even before we had AIs. So I think that from the computer's viewpoint, there are, um, it is going to be pretty challenging to analyze it with uh, computer programs because the computer programs will not be agreeing with a lot of the opening moves. The opening theory has improved a lot throughout the centuries. Like we've had, even in Japan alone, we've had something like um, several centuries of very high uh, intense study of the game by professional. Mm -hmm. uh, professionals of a level close to the professionals we have nowadays, at least. And um, so that has really brought the opening theory to a higher and higher levels uh, continuously. And um, I think the opening levels that we have had before computers, just before, just this century, were pretty high, or pretty close to what um, computer programs are giving us or now. And we were already pretty close to that. Um, but there might be a bit of difference between that and the historical games. So right. I'm, I'm sort of challenged as to how I'm going to work about that. And, and because they are very interesting and valuable games. And they actually get much better in the middle game. Uh, right. Because they have plenty of time usually. Uh, I think these, uh, these next three volumes are going to take. I mean, these, these next three volumes should come quicker. We the, the, the big delay, honestly, we had the, most of the content did not take relatively that long. It was working out. You know, how do you do the, um, the playable diagrams in a way that we liked and also embedding the videos and all of that stuff took time. And I got to give a big shout out to uh, Anders and Myron and, and uh, Mike Samuel, uh, who did the beautiful cover, actually. I'm going to be doing an interview with Mike Samuel. Uh, but the team that really spent an awful lot of time, because this, this is where we got pretty tough. We... we uh, we were we were not going to do it. You know, there's there's a uh, there's Mike's beautiful cover, and I have to tell you a quick story about that cover. You know, about a year ago, Michael uh, Michael and I, uh, Michael Redman and I thought we, we we thought we were close a year ago. As it turned out, there were some technical things that still had to be dealt with. So we thought, oh, we better start dealing with a cover. And so I tracked down Mike Samuel, and, and Go players will know Mike has done the uh, the graphics uh, for so many Go congresses. He's he's a real familiar guy, but. I kind of lost track of Mike, and it turns out he's he's in your old stomping grounds uh, over in, in uh, Southern California. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I called him up, and uh, I told him about you know what the book was looking like and what our thoughts were. And we, I, I don't think he and I talked for more than honestly 10, 15 minutes. And and I said you know we're still probably a few months out, but just wanted to get this you know you know give it some thought and you know in, in a few weeks or so you know shoot me some things. It was. It was in, I'm not kidding, it was within an hour. Within an, <laughs> within an hour, he sent me, not what you just saw, but it was it was basically that. We had to do some tweaking, because I think I sent them to you right away, actually. I forwarded them to you, to, just to make sure that we, I liked them right away, but I wanted to make sure we weren't off on the wrong track. And uh, you you responded positively, and I think you had some, some suggestions. And we actually, the title originally, this is reminding the title originally, and I, We'll take the blame for this. My thought was to do just A to Z. I thought the A to Z was a clever idea. But uh, when Mike Samuel did the designing, he said, well, that doesn't work. And, and he was the one who actually said, you gotta, you gotta have alpha go to zero. So you know, we're, we're gonna give Michael full credit for, uh, I mean, this, this guy is a top level designer. I gotta tell you, you know, just to throw some business his way, but uh, he's really, really brilliant. Um, all right, uh, before, one last question, and I'm doing this one because this is from a guy that you and I both know, uh, spent a lot of time with our, our Go photographer, John Pinkerton. He wants to know if the players are using the AlphaGo-inspired moves, uh, if, if the, the people who are using the AlphaGo-inspired moves are gaining a clear advantage over those who are sticking to the older moves. That's a really good question. So the people, yeah, you've talked about that in some of your commentaries, actually. Well, you know, people started using AlphaGo-inspired moves uh, immediately after the Lisa Dahl match. 
And the problem with that is that we did not understand how they work sometimes. <laughs> like the least of all match was easier because it was just that uh, shoulder hit maybe. Right. Um, and that, that happened in, that was game number two, right? Um, and a few moves maybe. But uh, when we started seeing the next versions of AlphaGo, like the master version, uh, it really took off and everyone was trying to emulate that, use some of the AlphaGo inspired moves but uh, we didn't really know how they were working. Like we only saw the game versions that were in this limited number of games. And we had to imagine how AlphaGo would reply to different moves. And sometimes we were wrong. So people were using it, but the advantage to that was limited, I would say. It was, mm -hmm. there was a kind of a surprise effect or novelty effect that maybe gave the player playing it um, an advantage at, at the very least, uh, we had more fun playing the alpha moves. <laughs> <laughs> but then when we did have computer programs to help us analyze them, we were getting some answers to the unanswered questions like that we were still puzzling at. And the difference is that computer programs with the AlphaGo system um, are very good at assessing positions. Like they give you a score, which um, I am willing to trust to a certain extent. Like I, I have to, account for the fact that most of these programs are working with a seven and a half point Komi and what amounts to a Chinese rule set. So that's different from what I play normally, but I can sort of adjust for that. Once I get used to it, I can adjust for that. And the score that the computer gives me is very um, reliable once I do that. Cool. All right, good, good questions, and we are going to go ahead and take a look at the uh, the winner, uh, which is game four. Uh, but do go ahead and uh, keep uh, keep on with the questions, both general questions. We'll take any questions uh, that you have about the match itself. We have lot we have lots of stories. Some we tell some stories uh, in the book. There are photos in the book, by the way. Michael and I would go on these long walks, and I took photos on those walks, and so some of these photos you'll be seeing for the first time. But uh, questions about the match, questions about uh, uh, the book, and of course, questions about game four. And it looks like we have game four up there now. So uh, do you want to do uh, just, uh, I mean, obviously everybody knows this is the, the one that uh, Lisa it all won. And I, we actually, this was another last minute addiction. We actually found this wonderful picture. So many of the pictures of Lisa Dahl, he looked. He looked just so sad. Remember, I mean, he was he was under so much pressure. He often the pictures. He just looks like he has the weight of the world on him. And we found two wonderful pictures. One is the smile that he had at the press conference after this game. Remember that? Yeah, I remember and we, that. And then we also uh, at the end of the book, and I'd never seen this. It was in the special press section. Uh, there's a picture of Lee and his daughter with an ice cream cone that is. I mean, to me, it's a whole. It's one of the best reasons for doing the book. It made me really happy. She was sitting in his lap, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that it, was a nice picture. Yeah. And he, yeah, and he just looked. I mean, you could see that he he had his. He knew what was important. Yeah. All right. So, what can you tell us about Game Four? Well, I could start with the first three games, just uh, like the first game. Um, it was uh, Lisa all played a very unorthodox opening, and my take on that was that he was trying to. He was assuming that AlphaGo was somehow using a database. Right. Um, and that was what I was assuming at the time until the people from DeepMind told me that it was completely different. <laughs> uh, so, so I think Lisa Dole was assuming that. And he played an opening that uh, was probably never seen before. And um, because of that, it was probably just bad. <laughs> good, idea. So, good, good idea. Good wrong, idea. Wrong strategy. Right, and so um, AlphaGo, it turns out AlphaGo quickly took the lead, but no one wanted to believe it, and I didn't want to believe it. And the fight spread out to the game, and AlphaGo at some point in the game starts to play very slow, steady moves. And I was upset with that. I thought it was um, just slack. And it turns out that at that point, AlphaGo already um, probably already had a very high winning percentage as far as it was concerned. And, I, have, um, I have to jump in here because what you, you guys have to know, and I think we actually might have talked about it on, on the sh uh, when we broadcast, but Michael was constantly trying to get into the control room. We would, we would see the program. We got to be pretty good friends with the programmers. I mean, you know, they had insight. And, and, and when we got stuff wrong, which, you know, was, was not, not, 
I mean, about the technical stuff, not about the yeah, code. Yeah, they would correct but, us, yeah. But it was interesting. There was this tra knowledge transfer. They wanted to know stuff about the Go because most of them were not Go players, or they certainly weren't strong Go players. And, and we wanted to know stuff about the programming. So, you know, you would do a whole dump on the Go, and they would sort of parcel out little bits of technical information, you know, uh, that, that, that we would then try and use in the, in, the, uh, in the broadcast. But we never did get in that control room. Never, yeah. <laughs> so we we never got to see how AlphaGo was assessing the game, right? And if you watch if you watch the DeepMind video, you can see that the, they were monitoring that. Yeah, they were. Um, so that was the first game, and it was this big fight, and it was the most impressive, I think, in the way Lisa Law was reacting. Like you could see his jaw drop at some points. Um, and then the second game, when AlphaGo had Black. Uh, it was a much more slow and positional game, uh, and it was the game where AlphaGo played the famous shoulder hit. Yes. And it just sort of, in a completely different type of game. The first game was a bit more tactical. The second game was a kind of a positional, slow-paced game with um, most of the territories staying intact throughout the game. And AlphaGo, again, completely outplayed Lisa Dahl. And so it was, you could see that Lisa Dahl was sort of trying to find a weak point there. And then in the third game, he had Black again. So Lisa Dahl was, had Black, he was supposed to take the initiative. This time he played a more conventional um, Chinese opening. Um, and he at attacked very strongly. And again, AlphaGo outfighted him. So at the time of the fourth game, I've finally gotten to the fourth game now. <laughs> well, at the I time just... of the fourth game. But we do just to remind folks, though. So this was this was a match. This was a million dollar match, and it was you know best of five. And so one of the important things to know about game four is that uh, once once uh, once Lisa Dahl had lost that that third match, in, in some ways the pressure was off. He, he'd lost the match, right? And so I mean I think you actually had talked about this that he actually seemed. I mean, he was sad, um, but in some ways he was a little bit relieved, right? I mean, he could just sort of play at that point. Maybe. Um, I think you'd have to ask Lisa at all. I think people would have, different people would have different reactions to that. Right, right. Um, but you could see that he was still, he was trying different tech ways to, to try to get around AlphaGo. But at the time of the fourth game, uh, he was running out of plans. Like he'd, he'd try... He had tried three different uh, plans up to that point, and he had sort of run out. And, but he did get it into a position where he had, I think his plan in this game was to take a lead in territory at least, mm -hmm. and um, rely on his fighting strength to reduce the moyo that AlphaGo got. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he, he did use that kind of a plan and of course, amazingly, it worked out with that uh, fantastic move that he played. Oh, we're gonna get to see that. Yeah. So just to, as we get into the game here again, because I know we have sort of two, this is, this is like a flashback to, uh, to the match. We have two different audiences here. We have some of you that don't know uh, anything or not much about the game. So don't hesitate to ask, like when Michael used the term like Moyo, that means a big area of the board. And if you're not sure, ask, because either Steven will answer it in the chat uh, or if we think that, you know, we, we may answer it as well. But we also know that a lot of you are very experienced Go players and are going to want to ask very technical questions, which, as you know, Michael loves. The more technical, the better. We should have a stump, stump, uh, stump Michael, see if somebody can ask you a really, really tough technical question. But uh, so we will we will try and, and, and uh, get to both of those audience simultaneously. Sure. sure. All right. Well, in this time of computer programs, there will be some some pro, uh, questions that I have trouble answering, I'm sure. No, that's not true. You can answer all questions. I have total confidence. Okay, so this is a game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Black has Black is AlphaGo in this game, and it's game four. Uh, again, it plays the hanging connection. Actually, this is an interesting point because modern um, AI's Go programs that are using the same system. They have stopped playing this hanging connection. They play a solid connection. Um, they play a solid connection at this point. Hmm. And no one really knows why. <laughs> we really? have theories. We have ideas about it. 
but um, like it, it, that sort of changes depending on the on the on the position, the overall position. Uh, in this case, I think that uh, a reason that black would maybe not play the hanging connection is that it is not always forcing towards white's corner group, like in the game white answered here. Um, in the first game, we said all played at A in the same mm -hmm. board position. Okay. Um, it's normal to answer there, but uh, in modern Go, after the AIs, uh, there are a lot of cases where people are just playing away instead of playing that move. So there's a connection there, but whether it's 100% uh, valid or not is, is hard to say, and it depends on board positions too. So in the game, they actually played this normal Joseki. Um, so you can see actually AlphaGo um, at this time is not quite as alien, you might say, or different from what humans were playing. It's very close to humans. And uh, you might remember this version of AlphaGo was derived from, it, it did start by learning from human games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so at the very base of, of of its um, generation. It is starting with human knowledge, which makes it in this way very different from uh, AlphaGo Zero, which started with no human knowledge at all. And even with Master, which did start with the same basic human knowledge, but had um, been regenerated enough times to be starting doing a lot of new stuff that we didn't see. So this is uh, after black pincers here on the upper side. This is maybe the first branching point where like I was suggesting, uh, this is the game move, uh, two space. And, and the general idea here for white is to um, get a position on the left side of the board on the third line there. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this, the way this worked is that when black plays here, white plays here, white's getting a two space extension, uh, which is pretty much a solid base on the left side starting to attack, um, hoping to attack this black stone. So taking the aggressive side on the left side of the board. Um, I was suggesting maybe white should have do, done it this way. And um, if black plays the same way, something similar in the corner, then this is uh, a better seated position. On it's, it's compared to the game, basically. There is a one line difference there. It's, it's one line down on the board, just to compare these two positions. And so that puts it closer to this black stone. And in, by doing that, it makes white's pincer, white's attack on that marked black stone is stronger. And white's group on the side actually has more, more space on the side because it has, um, eventually it could play the other mark point that I've just marked um, to make some extra eye space on the side. So it makes, and this would be a stabler group for white as well as being a stronger attack on the black stone. So there, it's good things, just good things alone. So so uh, I also was suggesting maybe black's going to play in this direction, and it will just be a completely different game. So this is a variation that I was suggesting here, stuff like this. Um, and I thought that maybe this would be better for white. Hmm. And like the problem that we had at the time of AlphaGo is that even strong professional players would have opinions um, but we weren't 100% sure, and the fact that we have computer programs now is taking us closer to being sure about our assessment of a position. So because we have the com uh, computer can give us a, a second opinion. So let me just ask about that real quick because, you know, two things. At the time, of course, you know, it was, I mean, you know, you, you and I were doing commentary, you know, and then in the English language, and then there was a Korean commentary, but I mean, uh, as you say, you know, you could have any, you know, different nine dot professionals up there uh, would have some different ideas. And certainly nobody would turn to a computer program at that time for any kind of idea on that. And it took it took a little while for it to develop some some uh, confidence in, in the AIs. Right. I mean, I remember even even. Well, you know, the Biggest problem was that because AlphaGo was not interactive, it was just suggesting moves for games so it could play. Um, but they did not even link it to the internet. Um, and it was not interactive. So I could not say, what if Black plays here and put in a move and 
ask AlphaGo what it's going to do about that. It, I could only play with, well, I couldn't even play with AlphaGo. But like, Lisa Dahl could play with AlphaGo. But like, he could not, after the game, he could not ask AlphaGo, what would you have done if I had played here? <laughs> and I'm sure even Lisa Dahl wanted to ask that question. But mm -hmm. it wasn't available. And the fact that the later programs that use the open sourced AlphaGo um, algorithm, you might say, or the system, I guess it should be called a system with the neural networks. Um, they, since they open sourced that, various computer programs were made to be interactive with that. And it made a big difference. So, mm -hmm. so because there's no way I can understand uh, what AlphaGo was thinking with just the game variation. I, I really needed to have um, variations for different moves that I would suggest. Mm -hmm. And that was why I was trying to get into the control room. Yeah, I, right. I wanted to. I wanted to fiddle with it. <laughs> well, now you have. Now you have Leela. So I have Leela. I have Katago too. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. And they're different. Like they, they have their different good points. But well, folks should uh, check out. Actually, uh, Stephen can put up the link. We have a YouTube channel with. I forget how many. We've done a lot, a lot of these videos. And uh, if you want to get into the weeds, uh, that's the, check it out. Michael Michael will, will take you there. So, all right, so back to the game here. This local position in the upper left corner is actually a position that has occurred um, a number, a large number of times in professional games. It's a very common position where Black's idea is to play two moves in the upper left corner to make what is going to be a territory there. Mm -hmm. And so shortly before, well, a few years, I guess, at least before AlphaGo showed up, the way we played this was changing because uh, White was finding this to be uh, just slightly advantageous for Black. So people were th thinking this, this variation here was slightly better for Black, basically because if we mark these two stones, the marked White stone is pretty useless. And the, if we call it an exchange for the Blackstone there, that exchange has um, taken away a lot of potential for white to reduce that black territory. And so the black territory is very solid. It's a very um, hard to reduce territory if we compare it to any other three stones. Like there's three stones, I would call there, I would say that there are three significant black stones there. Um, it's a majority of four to one. So three of those stones were invested by black to make that area. Um, for if I if we had just the mark three stones, it would not be such a secure area. Any position with just three black stones is not going to be as good for black as this game position. So people were changing that. And the way they changed it was that white would extend here. Um, and if black answers this way, then white would be playing here with the idea uh, with the idea that if black plays here, in this case, there's still some potential. Uh, for the time being, white would be playing away, but white has that um, slide at A, that move at A, which um, if white plays at A, white's going to be able to make a position on the upper side, going to be living there or something like that. It's sort of ambiguous, like sometimes white's going to sacrifice the two stones anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but white's going to get something out of a slide at A. And so I was very surprised, and this was basically, it was the modern way to play. This was the old, the game move was the old fashioned way to play. I was really surprised that uh, Lisa Dahl did not play the modern, modern move. Yeah. And so in the commentary, I go into some variations where I, I try to guess why he wouldn't play that. Um, but I, I, I still, it's sort of a mystery to me even now. I think when I looked into it with a computer program with Leela, um, it didn't really change the, my recollection is that it didn't really change the score. So mm -hmm. maybe it's not so important to uh, a computer program, but uh, that was something I, I wondered about, the difference between the, the choice here. Mm -hmm. So I do a, a few, I think I did some sub variations in that, um, going into that variation. So just a reminder to folks, uh, this is uh, game four, as you see there with Lisa Dahl and, and AlphaGo. Uh, this was after uh, AlphaGo had, had won the match 3-0. Uh, 
Uh, and as Michael, when he's referring to his commentaries, these are the commentaries that are in uh, AlphaGo to Zero Volume 1, um, which was, uh, we, we look at, uh, you do commentaries on all five of the games. Our original thought, to be honest, was that uh, we were just going to, because we knew that we had, you know, the four different, uh, we had the whole, we wanted to look at all the AlphaGo games. So we were actually just going to pick a few of the key games. I'm trying, I think it was game Game two and game four, is that right? I think you just picked two games originally to look to look more deeply at in the when we were just gonna do the one volume. I think I it was just those two games that I was most excited about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then we realized actually about a year ago that we were really gonna have to uh, look at all five games and, and do the one volume and that this uh, project had become um, somewhat somewhat bigger. I also just want to say, uh, just remind folks to thank everybody for watching, but also uh, I know that wherever you are in the world that you are uh, dealing one way or another with the coronavirus. And I just want to remind folks to be careful and safe. And I know that everybody is trying to to do that, uh, but it's yeah. a very serious thing. And uh, we all, I know I'm talking to my parents every day. It's, it's uh, be, you can't be too careful. I, I don't yeah. care what anybody says. It's, it's a, uh, you know, I just scratched my cheek. <laughs> You're not supposed to touch your face. Right. I, I, yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. But we're, you notice <laughs> that Michael and I are not shaking hands, and that's uh, a yeah, good. yeah. <laughs> All right. So yeah, this was uh, this was an interesting, uh, you know, and and uh, looking at it now, especially after we've done so many AlphaGo commentaries, uh, even now, are, are you sort of learning new things or having new observations, or you you pretty much have a handle on this at this point? Well, um, ever since this um, this match. They continued, well, I was studying this, and then after that they came out with the Master Games, and they continued to come out with various sets of games. Um, I was continually studying this match and the games that followed, so I was sort of connected to it throughout, uh, and I'm still discovering things about it. It's a great thing about, game, uh, I've got, uh, about the game of Go, is that there's always more to discover. Exactly. So to go, go a bit further into the game, um, so white is, has set up an attack on the left side of the board now. With this move, white has a very solid corner position, the lower left corner. Um, this is already, uh, for all practical purposes, this is guaranteed to be a white corner territory, right? Yeah. So that is the point where black can um, immediately start playing forcing moves against it. This is something that is sort of counterintuitive, but it's something that any professional player knows. Um, because once it's a white territory, it's okay for black to make it even stronger. Because if, for instance, if white answers that in this fashion and this way, then this has uh, really solidified the, the wall for white's territory. And so the white corner now, if it was something like 90%, 99% uh, white territory before, now it's probably closer to 100%. Um, so it, it's, it has been... Uh, improved, you might say. White's position in the corner isn't being improved, but with these two stones on the outside, Black's position towards the center of the board and the left side of the board, uh, when Black continues with something like this, is is very different too. And so the, the, the Black game is bigger than the White game. And with Go, everything is, is a trade like this. You, it's a trade-off. You're losing something in one direction, you're usually gaining something in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that White had already secured that corner with uh, the, the move uh, the move here um, on the second line means that Black is losing less when Black makes that trade and allows White to surround the corner. And so that's um, this move here is a very um, uh, interesting. It's an important move in the game. It's, um, it's a move that usually would be a bit vulgar. It would be um, solidifying the White position. But in this case, where black has to handle that marked stone, the, the stone marked with the triangle, black has to deal with that stone. And any kind of exchange is going to improve that. So that was black's plan. And it was very interesting to see that after all, Alpha, we didn't really know very much about AlphaGo, but we were seeing that AlphaGo was playing with a plan, seemed to be playing with a plan. I don't think AlphaGo is supposed to play with a plan. Like it, it plays the best move or mm -hmm. the, a good move that it finds. It's not as if it makes its plans the same way that human players do, but it's 
appearing to make a plan, just like a, a human player would, and a very similar plan in this case. So that was interesting. And white counterattacked. In this case, um, there, the corner becomes insecure a bit. And so in the game, it's again very interesting. Black has played once at A and now plays away to the left side, leaving some potential in the, in the corner. And this again, very much resembles what a strong human player would play. Um, Black could continue like this. This would be the straightforward way to play. But um, the local fight is going to be advantageous for white. Like this is dangerous for black on the left side of the board. It looks dead. Um, so maybe I shouldn't say dangerous. So it's, it's more or less <laughs> over. Um, so the local fight is not good for black. And that is something that happens a lot when you might notice that in the lower left area, white had more stones than black to start with. In the very local area, white had three stones in that corner. So when you fight directly like this, quite often you're going to get into trouble. So this is a very human-like uh, way for black to handle it. Um, because, and white immediately captured the one stone. So white, in this case, white has gotten some extra profit towards the corner, but black gets two moves on the side. And so it's another trade-off. Again, uh, white's profit was in an area, oh, I forgot, I have the pen here. White's profit was in an area that belonged to white already. So this, this corner was white's territory to start with. It's gotten better, but it was an area that was belonging sort of to white already. Black's profit is in this direction. This was an undecided area, and now it's decidedly better for black. So the trade there was very good for black. It was, it was a good strategy to try to trade in that direction. Not necessarily bad for white, but um, the way black is playing is functioning in a fashion that was um, understandable for human players. And let me just ask you, just sort of going back to it, just to remind folks, this is you know, this is uh, the game four, and and at the time, this is four years ago. Nobody had ever seen, a, you know, a, a go playing program that was, you know, certainly that couldn't couldn't even play, honestly, uh, that strong in terms of amateur level. Certainly not professional level at that point. Uh, right? Actually, I should correct that just a little bit. There was sure. um, the the final stage. There was a stage where they made a little jump, um, even before we had the AlphaGo. Uh, mm -hmm. neural networks. And so they were um, they were done ranked amateurs. They, there were some programs that were done ranked amateurs. And they were playing some good moves. But the problem was that uh, they weren't really good in the same way that human moves were. Well, it's still true <laughs> of AlphaGo. Um, but there was something sort of different in the way they were reasoning. They, 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 they weren't quite as logical as the moves that AlphaGo is showing in this game. Mm -hmm. So I was really remarking about how um, how human it, it looked like a very strong human player at this point. And in this game four, in the opening at least, it was looking even more so than it was in the first three games. And I think that I just remembering that that was the thing that I mean, you were honestly you were like a kid in a candy shop, you know, when we were doing the commentaries, because it was clear, you know, from game one that you know, there was just something else going on. I mean, I. I think you know we were pretty confident that that DeepMind was not going to to attempt this unless they had you know a high level of confidence. But we had also talked to the you know to some of the team members, and they didn't. I don't think and we you know we should probably do another show with them. I don't think they thought they had a lock on it. You know they had played the games with Fan Hui, and Fan Hui is is a wonderful Go player, wonderful human being. But, you know, Lee Sedol is a, is a Go player of an entire other magnitude. And, and so this was a pretty uh, gutsy move, you know, to take on, on Lee Sedol with this, this program. And just thinking back to the chess playing uh, programs, you know, it did, not, it did not necessarily go the same way, right? Well, I think AlphaGo had probably, I think um, someone told me at some point that AlphaGo had done a self-assessment and thought it was stronger, strong enough to win. Mm -hmm. um, but they they weren't sure about it because they didn't know if there were any unknown bugs in the system or um, or maybe it was just mistaken in its assessment. So they, which, they were which, just since they were not 
professional level Go players, except for Fran Huy, of course, who was on the team at that point. Um, they were not sure. Right. And we're actually going to see an example of one of the things they were worried about a little bit later in this game. So we In should... this game, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, you should tell me if I'm running out of time so I can get to it. So uh, there, okay. this is a very natural um, sequence here where black is sort of leaning on white on the left side. And in the process, black is handling that weak. The, the black group is weak too. So especially these stones are, they, they, they sort of consist of weak group. And so black is leaning on the white group mm -hmm. in order to either strengthen that black group or like if white uh, cuts too early, sometimes black is even going to sacrifice it. And you can see that black is starting to build this huge, huge framework on the upper side of the board. This whole area is what we would call a moyo or, or sphere of influence for black. And there's some potential for the whole area to become territory, which would, of course, be a win for black, even if black loses some stones on the left side. So white has built a living shape on the left. And after that, now black is going to connect. <clears throat> and this was a very unhuman way for black to connect those stones. And I remember I, I pounced on this move. And the point is, a human would usually play a connection at, at the mark point, at least before we had computers. The computers tend to prefer this connection that is 100% connected. This is a hanging, a double hanging connection is always 100% connected. Like if white peeps here, black can disconnect. If white peeps here, black can connect. In actual practice, maybe black's not going to answer both of the peeps. Like the second one is not so, it's not, you can't be so sure that black's going to answer it with a connection. Um, humans tended to think that allowing white to peep from both sides would just be a very awkward shape. Mm -hmm. But computers seem tend to uh, prefer to have this position which is 100% connected. Whereas if black plays the better shape here, it's going to be okay. I think it's going to be okay, but there are some cases where, like if the ladder is going to be good for white. If, at this point, the ladder is good for black, so it's not a problem. Um, if, even if the ladder is good for white, black can play moves like this and should have no problem with handling this. But there could, uh, there will be exceptions, of course. So that, that's, um, that would be a reason why computers like to be 100% connected here. And strong human players have started to copy that idea also. Mm -hmm. So it's it's changed the way we've played also this one too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many things um, the things people play. We, we're not so worried about older players getting annoyed with us when we do something that is not conventional, because <laughs> we have the computer programs that do that too. And so White jumps in, and you can see um, I've been talking about AlphaGo's tech uh, strategy, you might say, up to this point. You can see what Lisa Ola is doing with this game. You can see he's getting solid territories in the lower left corner, the left side. Um, and well, the lower right corner is pretty solid. The right side is still undecided, but he has taken an advantage in territory up to this point. Um, looking at blacks, so I might as well circle the white territories first. So there's this territory, that's close to 10 points. This territory is well over 10 points. You could say it's close to 20 points. This territory is more than 10 points. So it's something like 40 points that white has in solid territories. Now, black's area here, that's not a territory. Like any t at any point, white can jump in. It's not a territory. It's just, it's just a position that black has on the lower side. Right. Black's, black's only territory is in this area. In the upper right, black has something like 10 points. And even this territory, um, it can be reduced when white plays something like this which happens later in the game. Um, but White does have ways to reduce it. It's, it's maybe more than 10 points, but less than 20 points. So White has this large advantage in territory, and now he's going to invade deeply and do his best to trash the whole area. Mm -hmm. So that was, and, and I believe that Lisa all started the game with this plan. It was his, his game plan from move number one. Take, take uh, territory and then basically just try and uh, trash the Moyo. Right. Um, and at this point, instead of just uh, moving out, like he, he could have, um, 
well, this is something that I'm suggesting actually. But if white does this, black's just going to um, cover on the outside. Actually, this is not so effective, right? Uh, white has broken through, but white, black still has the potential to cover here next. And in this case, the whole upper side would become territory. And of course, 10 is also threatening to do stuff like this next. So this would probably be good for black. Um, instead of doing that, he goes in, inside the territory with this and then plays a very light move. Like instead of doing something like this, which would be heavy, it, it would not die, but it would give black a lot of extra uh, strength, like something like this, for instance. Um, I don't see this white group dying, but black's just going to attack a second time. And um, black's going to be getting, in the process, black is going to be getting some extra territories like Pretty soon, Black's going to be catching up and is going to take the initiative. Eventually, we'll even make this area into a Black territory by adding a stone to it. And so Black's going to catch up in territory. And not to uh, sort of give a little preview. Again, this is a commentary uh, that you can see and explore in, in our new book. And uh, Stephen will put that up there. But uh, one of the things that's going to be fun about doing the, uh, the Master games against human players was, you know, Master was just you know, was playing these these uh, pros, and and I remember when we were doing the commentaries, and in almost, I think in almost every case, Master would just get this lead, and this just sort of put it on cruise control, right? Yes, yes, in many of the, <laughs> um, many of the cases. So, and then there were some games that were relatively close. Actually, Master gave a lot of points away in the end game in most of the games. <laughs> it was sort of funny. <laughs> um, but it, it stopped giving away points when it was like one and a half points ahead. <laughs> and right. at that point, it stopped, stopped giving points it just, away. It was so just four. Was... Yeah, there were some games that were pretty close. There were some games that were actually dangerous because I think Master was using seven and a half points as its, right. um, for its rules. Yeah. Right. Hey, a good question here uh, from one of our viewers, uh, wondering whether any of the moves up to this point were quote unquote surprising. Apparently somebody who watched the commentary who can't remember and uh i think i think your point is that lisa you know had a had a had a pretty clear plan here so this is all going according to plan right for him it's going according to plan alpha goes playing is um very strong in a human-like way so it's not like the game number two where we saw that uh shoulder hit was which was sort of like a taboo move before and um and alpha Go played it and it worked really well in that game and so there, it, there wasn't that kind of surprise yet in this game. It was just playing very logical, uh, humanly understandable, strong moves. Like it was playing like a top level human player. Mm -hmm. Only no mistakes. Top level human players make mistakes. Right. So with this big, big move, difference. Yeah. White is taking a nice balance be, be, between saving the upper side stones or cutting at A to, to counterattack. The cut at A can be very effective if black gives white time to do it. And so that we're going to see AlphaGo speed up a little bit and to up the pace of the game, making it difficult for white to find a good time to play at A. Because white really needs to prepare for that by playing moves like uh, probably playing this move first. We're going to see this move play later in the game. Um, but this is not 100% forcing at this point, especially when black makes the game much more sharp with this move. Black Black is suddenly moving to attack here. And because this attack is a very forceful attack, it means white, for the time being, will not have time to cut at A. So Lisa Dole does not have time to realize the potential of what he was aiming at there because the game, the pace is suddenly speeded up on the right half of the board. He doesn't have time to cut at A. And that would potentially give the tempo to white. So black plays here, when black plays a shoulder hit like this, and again, it was another shoulder hit. It reminded us of game number two. Mm -hmm. This one is a shoulder hit of a, on the fourth line against a stone on the third line. So it's not, it's not um, as radical as the shoulder hit in game number two. But it's very, in fact, it's very effective in that it's speeding up the pace of the game and making an indirect attack on white's group on the upper side. The indirectness of the attack is what makes it so strong, because if white plays very carefully, white can obviously save the upper side, but then white would be giving up a lot on the right side of the board. So if we compare it to a, a more 
slow paced move, such as the, the capping move here or something like that, uh, this would be a more um, easy to understand attack on white on the in the center, like mm -hmm. something like this. Black's obviously trying to attack white's group in the upper side, uh, but when white protects that, there is less happening for black on the on the right side of the board. Like some, something like this might even happen, and white is hardly damaged at all. So that was kind of an extreme example, um, but comparing with this, this really ups the pace on the right side. White has to deal with that directly. And so we have this fight um, starting out from the right side. And we can see that black is sort of curling around here and turning it into an attack on white in the center of the board. So again, AlphaGo is playing understandable moves, but playing like a very strong human player. It was it was very human in this game, I think, for until it um, until it went a bit crazy. <laughs> which it's just coming up, which is but yeah. And just a reminder to folks too that that this is one of the cool things about Go. I mean, there's definitely uh, you know attacking and killing and dying of the groups here that you're looking at. Uh, but as you get stronger, uh, you don't necessarily actually kill, as you were talking about. Uh, a little bit earlier, you can make your territory, because it is a game of territory. You don't, right. you know, you, you can actually, and, and I think it was one of the games that, uh, one of your last games that we did, I don't know if it's been published yet, um, but it's, it's my favorite game that you've done recently where you kept giving away larger and larger groups and still won the oh, game. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I wasn't really succeeding. I, I, it was a bad game, but <laughs> yeah, it was sort of fun to see all my stones die like that, wasn't it? <laughs> but but my point is is that you know people would think, oh my god, you know he, these uh, uh, you know these stones are dying. This is bad, and not necessarily. I mean, if you can get use out of them, right? I have a number of games where I give up big groups and die. It's something that I was pretty good at when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, but uh, but actually, uh, a good number of them where I actually won the game too. Um, yeah. So sometimes yeah. it actually worked. Yeah, not not when I did it. <laughs> That's why you're a professional and I'm an amateur. So this was a point where White could have um, made the game relatively simple by playing something like this and allowing Black to capture this stone. And the fact that Lee Sedol did not choose it sort of explains. Like, it, it would just not be good enough. Um, Black uh, has this move here later to capture some stones on the upper side. So mm -hmm. White has not yet saved everything. White needs to add a stone there. Black has this strong position in the center of the board. And of course, the upper right corner is going to be a black territory now, probably. And white is just playing a lot of dummy points, uh, useless points on the board, is falling behind. And the meaning of this, this move is just going, going, sort of going away at this point. It's, it's not mm -hmm. as effective. It, it, it was going to be played to save the upper side. It's just that the position is changing so much that it's not having the same effectiveness in this position. So what's the what's the game assessment at this point uh, in terms of uh, balance of territory? Well, White still has something like 40 points. Like if we count some territory, almost 20 points in the lower left, more than 10 points on the left side. And it's, it's the same as I showed you before. It's this territory, this territory, and then about 10 points here. Most of the potential in the side is gone. Some potential here, that's not very much either. So it's in the vicinity of 40 points. And now we have some black territories that are relatively easy to see. So this looks like it's about 20 points. This is, um, if we assume that white is not gonna come in on the second line, which is not, not very likely yet. In that case, black has about 50 points, 15 points. Mm -hmm. So black has 35 points there. And in this variation I was showing, Black has a lot of influence towards the center of the board and still has moves like this, moves like this uh, to tickle white there. A lot of good moves for Black, not so many good moves for white. Mm -hmm. um, it just means that Black is close to whites in territory within about 10 points, I'd say, okay. and has a lot of areas where Black's territory is going to increase. So th th there's a lot of stealth territory, a lot of invisible territory there. That is going to increase. So you already like black better. I like black, and I you can just by looking at this move that Lisa all played, you can see that he knows that something simple like this is not going to be good enough. 
so he has the same assessment there. He and it's like it's okay for me to have been looking at this game for four years and say it's good for black. <laughs> <laughs> he saw it while he was playing. Right. And so that that's a top player, I'd say. Right. And again, if white does stuff like this, um, it's again going to be very painful. Uh, this kind of thing. White's going to be at a disadvantage in the center of the board and still has not really saved some of those stones on the upper side. You can see black is getting some territory in this area, probably. Right. Um, it's it's not satisfactory for white. So white is just going to continue fighting here. And black, but black gets to capture the right side, the upper side, sorry. The black gets to capture the upper side with this. So far, it's going very well for AlphaGo. White had needed to play this move. If Black had played there, the whole white group on the right side would have been in trouble. Right, right. Black, so, uh, yeah. No, I'm just sort of remembering that, you know, remember, just reminding folks, so we had already, this is this is actually not three days in because we'd had a break day in there somewhere. So I think this is probably four days in. You know, AlphaGo has won the match. This is game four. Uh, and I think, you know, you were saying then, then that, you know, this is looking pretty good. And I think we were all, you know, kind of already thinking that, uh, you know, it's going to be another, uh, it looks pretty solid for, for AlphaGo. But, uh, pretty good for AlphaGo. I, I don't think my um, emotion there was that it was pretty good. No. I, I, <laughs> I was saying, oh, God, it's, this one's gone too. Yeah. I, right. was I, was, was, I was thinking it was bad. Right. I was thinking it was bad at this point. All right. Uh, I, was, I was I was worried for Lisa at all. Yeah. Like it looks pretty hopeless. Like if that upper <laughs> side area, it, it, um, if I were playing at this point, I would be ready to give up on this area. Right. And it's just too much territory for black. So obviously, if, if you're Lisa at all, you have to find something to do with that area. Like I'm the commentator. I, I, I'm, I think I'm OK with, you know, saying. Well, there's no way White can do that. But right. he said, all oh, as the player, he has to find a way. Because otherwise, it's just a lost game. Right. So White cuts here. Um, and this Knight's move, again, it was so good. Like, if Black plays here, uh, that would be, um, it would not be very good. Because White would be able to reduce Black's upper side with this move. White gets to slip in and save those stones. So, for instance, if Black, uh, I could continue that a little bit. You look. Yeah, show, these. show, folks. Sir. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's important. This is, this is just so folks know. This is, this is the key. This is the key part of the game. Actually, this is, this is where everything happens. Well, this uh, would be too easy. Right. Uh, and this would allow White to get in. Black would place, and White would actually connect up, connect up fairly easily. Like with um, an actual play, White would probably play this one and, and cover here instead. Even cover here. White has a number of options. But this would just be so easy for White. White, would, um, ha White has a number of ways to handle this. This would be a win for White. So Black cannot play that way. And otherwise, if we go back to this position, if Black plays something to protect the upper side, it's a bit painful to allow White to do stuff like this and here. And you can see this Black group on the left this black group. It's being oh, cut up. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's in a bit of trouble. So once white escapes from the center, we will not really know who's attacking who. And you can see in this general area, it's a bit undecided too. We don't, it looks like if, we, if black just leaves the center area, there's going to be options for white to uh, get a bit further inside the black territory. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a big question. Black solves everything with this move. Just because now, there is no cut here. There's no immediate cut here. So the problem that White has now is that White has to find some way to set up this cut. And no I mistakes so far. Yeah, and I remember when, when Black played that, you, you were feeling pretty hopeful. I mean, it was, it was a great answer. It was a great answer. And so Lee said all, I think he was in his last three minutes, Yeah. if I recall correctly. I think you're and right. He, he was... He was so the overtime, he was the seconds were being read to him, and he looked desperate, and he played this move. And this is a fantastic move, <laughs> um, but it doesn't work. And the interesting part about this is that 
um, I was trying to, I was doing the live commentary. Yeah. So I was trying to catch up with the game and explain what Lisa Dahl was trying to do. Yeah. And then explain why it didn't work. Right. And I had my own answer to that. Turns out the Korean room, which was right next to us, uh, a, a top Korean pro was doing the commentary. He had a different answer. And I think we were both right. <laughs> uh, but AlphaGo didn't find either one. Like this was this was this was the game move. I had an answer for Black to make this work. So it's it's not a mistake in itself. This was the move that I think the Korean commentator was suggesting. And this actually it's, is a good variation because it shows what AlphaGo is trying to, what Lisa et al is trying to do also. The idea here is that white needs these three forcing moves at two and four and six. White needs these three moves to make the cut work. Like for instance, if white cuts here now, uh, sorry, that was a mistake. If white does this now, uh, then nothing's happening. Nothing's happening yet. So white plays an Atari here. If black answers it, now white can cut here. Now this is just working. It's just good for white. Black has lost these three stones. I'll mark them just to make it clear. These three stones have been captured by white. Mm, mm, mm. And so the whole white group is saved. Yeah, yeah. However, so that was Lisa Dahl's uh, wish, you might say. But um, actually, Black can answer here. This move, it takes care of the cut, because if white cuts now, now there's a liberty of these two stones that has been filled by Black 7. So Black can just play here. Wow. No problem, right? No problem. Otherwise, it also deals with the threat of this move by creating a solid connection here Black has filled a hole. Just so I, it might be in, easier to show you a mistake first. So, like if Black had played something like this to get rid of the cut, uh, that does get rid of this cut. But when White continues uh, with this and this, you can see Black has problems on this side. There's, there's a hole that White's going to punch through, or it's going to be a co at least. Maybe it's going to be this co. Uh, but this co again, um, if Black loses the co, the whole group on the left here is going to be in, in grave trouble. So that's a, a code that Black doesn't really want to get into. Mm. So um, to get back to the right answer for Black, instead of playing there, the correct move is to play here. And now uh, White cannot cut. And taking here doesn't help very much either. Again, the same variation. The whole whole group is collapsing. So this wow. was the, the solution that the Korean announced, the Korean professional who was doing a live commentary had, and mm -hmm. it works. That was that was simple enough. And I was too busy explaining uh, what Lisa Dahl was trying to do here. I think. Right. Um, and we got into this variation. It turns out I had an answer for this one too. But this was where AlphaGo went crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. It, it suddenly lost it, um, but actually Black could have played here. And this is an interesting variation. Like You would usually expect this to happen. Black takes, White plays here. It's Atari, Black takes, White plays here. Lo and behold, the, we have a co inside of Black's territory. <laughs> oh, um, turns out this is actually undecided. But just to go back a few moves, like it's, um, it seems obvious that Black's going to take here, but actually Black can take here. Now this is a move, which is sort of hard to see. It's um, counterintuitive because usually, just by looking at the shape, it's almost always better to take here. So I, I sort of have a theory that maybe since AlphaGo is very good at seeing good shapes, that's where it started, in a way. It's, um, that's one of its strong points, I think, to be able to find the good shapes immediately. Maybe it was missing this move because it's a bad shape, but mm -hmm. in this case it works because the cut at C, let's just go a few more moves, it's just not working. Like usually white would have some kind of a squeeze here. Right. Squeezing is not going to save white. If white plays here, 
again, this is not going to save white um, in two ways. Like in this case, black could just take the center stones. If white finds some ways to, if white finds some way to um, add a liberty for these stones in the center, even if black cannot take these five stones, black can take the stones on the other side too. Uh, these two stones. So black has a number of ways to deal with that. Nothing's happening inside the black territory. So black could have gotten away with this move. Uh, let's see. Did I make any other variations? It's just nothing is nothing is working. Wow. So, so do you think Lee was was just a desperate, like a hail mary, a desperation move? Um, I think it was a very effective desperation move. Like in a position like this, if you, I've been um, studying games, and I've been doing live commentaries for games by top pros in Japan too. When, you, when a, a player who is at the top of the world or at the top of his country gets into trouble like this, um, I've seen similar positions where the player will look at the position and find just bad results with just about every move. And under time pressure, that's just about as far as he gets. So what Lisa Dahl did with this move, he chose the one move where the result would seem to be uncertain. He choose, chose the one move where he could not immediately see a bad result happen. Interesting. It's so a, you it's find a... the most confusing move when you're in, in grave trouble. And obviously, if you're a weak player, maybe it's not so confusing for your opponent. But if you're a player like Lisa Dahl, you're, you're choosing a move that will confuse just about anyone. Like that, that um, he had a very good record um, being the top player in the world for decades. Like the previous, probably the previous two decades, he would he'd been the top player, if I remember mm. correctly. And so every time he got into trouble, he would do something like this and find a variation that was difficult for him to figure out. And so obviously it was difficult for his opponent too. What's interesting is that he comes up with that, you know, under time pressure, uh, after having lost three games to AlphaGo, I mean, certainly had no evidence that, you know, you could confuse AlphaGo. So I, I, I obviously haven't talked to him. I don't think you have either. But I mean, I don't I don't think there's any thought that that was his strategy was to was to confuse it. It's almost it almost seems like from what you're saying that it was sort of an instinctive play of a top player back exactly. into a corner. I think that was the word I was going, going to use, actually, instinctive. And it's something that uh, can be done by top players who are in in top form like a very like at, at, at any given time in history there's maybe a handful of players who can actually accomplish this in their in their games okay at a given time wow and yeah, i think that... at the time of lisa at all maybe it was just lisa at all who, who could do this kind of thing well, let's let's go on because it gets uh, i mean the, the, the game is kind of over pretty soon but this is it gets kind of i i want to i want to see the crash again i i well yeah <laughs> this move was a, sort of what maybe it's better not for Black to play this move because <laughs> it does get rid of uh, a lot of potential uh, on the right side. There was potential, for instance, for Black to be, if, if White loses some liberties, uh, like maybe some at some point Black can jump out here, there was still just a little bit of potential for those four stones. So playing here seems to be, playing that move seems to be bad. Relatively minor, but this was really bad. It, it was impossible to see what Alphago was trying to do. And I still don't understand this kind of the logic behind this kind of move because, well, I, obviously it's a computer program. It's not lo using logic the same way I would. But it's actually, in actuality, it's just reducing its winning potential. Mm -hmm. And so I have trouble seeing how the system would come up with moves like this. It's just a, a big mystery to me that has never been answered. And at the time I was suggesting that it was a Monte, Monte Carlo crash, which is mm -hmm. something that happens to uh, computer programs that play games like Go and use a Monte Carlo system to calculate the winning percentages. When the, everything is bad percentages, they come up with moves like this sometimes, which are just like wish moves, wishing that the opponent would play away or something and. and so uh, moves that are like co threats. So that's why I was suggesting it was Monte Carlo, but of course they told me it was not. Right. And so again, just to, to recap, uh, the move that I was suggesting in, a, in this position was to play 
without all of those bad black moves that we played on the right side, just to show you that variation again, yeah. black can, plays the hanging connection here, and if white throws in, black can capture the one stone. And nothing, nothing bad is going to happen. Um, it is more complicated when, uh, when white plays uh, this one. This variation is a bit more complicated when white can, um, can be cutting off black a little bit. And in this case, the mistakes that black is being played on has been playing on this side will be significant because they probably make the game a difficult game for for black. Wow. Um, because white will be able to reduce the black territory a little bit in this variation. And in, in the SDF file, I did go into that kind of variation a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so in the game, black just plays the capture. Again, I was showing you now that this is the better move. Um, provided Black has not played all that stuff on the right side. In the game when Black plays here, it's relatively easy for Lisa et al. to make that uh, thing, the idea he had in the center. It's relatively easy for Lisa et al. to make it work. So just at some point, I should show you what the idea here is. Okay. Um, so I'll do it with this move. So if Black answers here, White can play another Atari here. If Black again answers by saving the two stones, Again, we have a position where white can capture three stones in the center. Ah, three three stones. ah right, 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 right. Okay, I got it. So, um, so white, this, this move that white has just played here, it's a double threat. Basically, black has to answer the threat here and the threat here. So there's two areas where white is threatening. Uh, I'll mark the two moves. There's the cut here that white is threatening to play, and the connection here, which white is so I mean, like, mm, mm, there's mm. no way there's no way to get rid of both threats. Whereas if Black had played here, there was a way uh, to get rid of both threats. Both threats I, were covered. I'm I'm trying to remember, Michael. Maybe you remember. Um, there there was a cheering, and I think it was coming. It wasn't coming from our room. I think it was coming from the uh, Korean commentary room. Do you remember that? I remember that it, uh, it, during it, the game. No, I don't yeah, remember. That. Maybe yeah, I was yeah. just too caught up in my own. Oh, he, oh, you, oh, yeah. You were, you were, you were way. We, we were way deep, and I mean, because you know, it, it was just it, this was crazy what was happening. But there was there was cheering at a certain point in this, you know, where and I think it was right after the you know the key move when it became clear that something had something terrible had happened. You know that this was. Well, you, you know, know, I uh, I had been suggesting the only solution would be to. Um, Pull the plug, plug on plug the <laughs> they, they were not amused, by the way. They, they, <laughs> the people at uh, DeepMind were really worried about their internet connection and stuff like that. They were, they were really worried that some technical problem would um, interrupt the match. So, so yeah, I don't think they really liked that. I, I was I was suggesting pull the plug, but 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 I think at, this, <laughs> at, at, at a certain point in the sequence, it was looking that like that it basically happens. You know? Something very close to that. Like, um, you remember Aja Hong was playing the moves. Yes, that's right. Uh, he, at that lead. point of the okay. game, he would have done a lot better to set off the computer and play the moves himself. <laughs> oh. He's a pretty strong player. He's a very strong player. Yeah, yeah. Well, in this game, I think he would have had trouble against Lisa at all, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, this was, was just so shocking, the, the stuff that was happening with these black stones on the right side. Every single move that Black played was so, so bad. Like, it was gradually getting worse and worse, the position. Until it had a hopeless position. After which AlphaGo started playing normal moves. And so it's, it's sort of funny. Um, and this was actually what impressed some people. Some of the people who knew something about computers, some Go players who knew something about computers, what they told me after the match was the impressive thing is that AlphaGo started playing normal moves now. It's, it's starting to play a normal endgame again. So it's sort of recovered from the shock. And how did this happen? Because any computer program that we were used to would just completely flop at this point. So what's happening here, um, actually this attachment that AlphaGo played um, here, it's a, it's a stark move. It's a tesuji. Um, it's going to add some potential for Black to play moves like this and reduce the white territory. Actually, the whole se sequence there is functioning as a good sequence of moves for black. It's reducing white's territory, creating samaji, and black now is living on the left side. Um, everything black is doing here 
is working to an extent. But of course, the game is completely lost after what alpha go down on the right side. So um, some people who knew something about computers were saying that the big surprise was that AlphaGo started playing normal moves after mm. falling apart like that. And it's playing a normal end game. It, it's playing I, a normal end game, but it's hopeless. And and I remember what we were wondering at the time. Again, you know, we just we didn't know uh, hardly anything, but we were wondering, you know, did AlphaGo know how to resign? You know, that that uh, would, would would AlphaGo just play it out to the uh, to the very uh, you know, to the very end? Because um, we just weren't sure. Could, Resigned fairly quickly. And we saw in the AlphaGo self play games later that it does, in fact, all of those games, I think technically all of them were resulted in designations. That's right. That's right. You're so right. It does, it does resign a lot. Yeah. <laughs> As we know. So uh, um, there were a, a few more uh, very strange moves towards the very end. Like you can see these, uh, these plays on the first line here were sort of weird. They're not moves that humans would play. Um, there were some bad moves on the right side of the board in, in this area. There were some more bad moves, that is. So it, it did go berserk a little bit at the very end of this sequence. But most mm -hmm. of the time, it was interesting to see that it, uh, it sort of lost it for a while. And then it came back and started playing pro-level moves once more. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting to see that. And it impressed some of my colleagues who knew more about computers than I do. Yeah, yeah. So this was a good good choice by everybody. It was a, the right the right one to uh, to choose. So thank you uh, for that. Um, and <coughs> Harry, excuse me. It's okay, just a regular sneeze. Um, but uh, just a really uh, you know again to sort of set that up that this was you know uh, the AlphaGo had not only not only won three games but but won three games very convincingly. You know, and, and, and we had, you know, to, to see Lee Sedol, you know, beaten three times so convincingly and and just, you know, you and I not only did all the commentary, but then we would uh, go and there would be the press conference with, I mean, hundreds. I mean, we'd never seen a press room like this before. It was a ballroom full of hundreds of reporters from around the world. The, the, the flashing of the light bulbs was just, uh, you know, blinding and uh, you know, Port Lisa Dahl would have to go up there, you know, uh, on the stage and sort of say something. Um, uh, and then we, you and I would take turns, you know, one of us would, would, would say something uh, as well. And I think the, the Korean commentators would, would do it as well. Uh, and it was just an, an amazing thing to actually, uh, and it was, it was the only game that, uh, just to, you know, spoiler alert, you know, the next thing that happens, this will be the next volume of, of our book, uh, is mysteriously, so this was in uh, March of 16, 2016, and then in, I think, New Year's Eve, actually, we just found out it was actually Taiwan time, as it turns out. I think we thought it was uh, China uh, time. I think it was December 29th in, uh, the, in the West, and maybe the 30th in Taiwan time. Yeah. Right. And so this uh, uh, mysterious goat player you know, starts showing up and taking on pros, and is uh, you know, you know, it's a small go world. Word spreads very fast, and some sort of bot is defeating top players. Has you know, it's a uh, ten and zero, twenty and zero, thirty and zero. This is impossible, right? And then it shows up on, I think, a different go server, right? Right. Uh, yeah, I think it went to two go servers, Fox and Taijun. Right. Um, and I think the Chinese players knew because like most of the people who played it were Chinese. Um, almost all of them were famous top professionals. And um, actually, just to go back to Lee Sell for a bit, uh, maybe people who um, are tuning in to go recently um, have not heard so much about Lee at all. But at the time, uh, he was super famous. Like he, for um, decades, he had been the top player in the world, um, almost always winning um, and people were afraid of him. Like he was intimidating. Just the fact that we had studied his games and we knew about him, we knew how scary he could be as a Go player. And to see him being defeated like that and um, just the visual effect of the way he was um, being hit by these moves that AlphaGo was playing, his reactions to them, 
um, it made such a big difference. It was um, it was quite shocking um, and exciting. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I guess it's exciting too. Of course, at the time of the game, he was no longer the no, number one player. I think he was ranked about number three or something like that. But he was still at the top, and we still had a very vivid memory of how fierce and strong he was when he he was number one. Mm -hmm. And it was just a, a it was very recent at that point. It was just a few months earlier. Right, right. And we no. didn't really know whether he was going down the ranks or maybe just temporarily the low number one. Well, and 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 uh, it, there would be that match with KJ. Uh, uh, same thing, exactly same the thing. same thing. Yeah, right. KJ was actually, I think, he was at that time the number one ranked world player. And that wasn't even close. I mean, that was that was just. Uh, it was even know. more convincing. And, and right. like you, you could see from the start that I don't think KJ really expected to win. Um, well, I don't want to spoil it for people, but I, <laughs> I think that it was. A, uh, we knew more about AlphaGo, and it just seemed just less likely. Right, right. Uh, and so the the, uh, the the those games, and then uh, the the master versus the uh, the the and, and the master games are just. Uh, I, I actually really look forward to those. Those are really interesting games because you see a lot of different top players uh, trying different things, and 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 the difference there. And there was a question earlier. Uh, of somebody who was wondering, you know, four years on with all the experience that top, you know, that people have with playing AI, you know, could somebody as like yourself, for example, go back uh, and play that version of AlphaGo and win? I don't see it. Do you? I mean, I, I that. Well, you know, not only was the system very good, I think that the the people who were making it or um, doing the system, the engineers there. They were um, tweaking the system somehow. Uh, you could see, I could see at least in the process, how they had fixed the problem we saw in this very game. In the Master Series, you could see that uh, that that weakness had seemed to go away. Some of the mm -hmm. weaknesses that we saw mm -hmm. in the Lisa at all match. It's, it seemed to have, uh, AlphaGo seemed to have trouble with some extremely tactical positions that Lisa at all was making for it. And that weakness seemed to go away. It seemed to be having some problems even with codes. It had um, unusual ways to handle codes, which seemed to be incorrect to us. Um, but that was getting better as time progressed also. Mm -hmm. And so we could see that AlphaGo was improving in ways that seemed to be technically difficult for most computer programs. For most of for, for programs like Leela and Katago, um, they, they do have um, issues that are hard to get rid of. And I think that the um, AlphaGo was better at that maybe. And I think that also the fact that AlphaGo had access to the Google computer, which had this was a, a super computer, the uh, computing power there is something that cannot be equaled by uh, modern day, these programs that we put on our own laptops. It's, it's not the same thing, even if we have a uh, GPU. Right. Um, and so the computer power, the computing power that uh, AlphaGo had made it a very strong system. I think it is comparable at least to the best computer programs that we have now. Right. And it's probably stronger if you put it on that, that Google, well, I, th I think it only works on the supercomputer anyway. But I think that it was, um, it, it could still be a um, very strong player if it came out of retirement. Couple of other questions. Uh, these are some good questions, folks, uh, and, and keep them coming. We'll we'll take them right up to the end. Um, they're wondering uh, how AI inspired changes in the opening have have they been better for black or whiter or about even? Would you say? With the development, well, um, with most of the programs that work on seven and a half point Comi, mm. it it has been very difficult to find winning strategies for black. Because black starts up with uh, something like 43%. It depends on the program. Like um, some programs work with a smaller, like, like Katago gives black a better winning percentage. But uh, most of the programs that use seven and a half point Komi as their uh, to evaluate the games just give white an advantage to start with. And that makes it hard to find, hard to see 
when black is improving. Like it's, it's um, just because the way the computer programs evaluate it is not the way that humans do. Like humans usually look at the amount of territory and start there. Uh, but that's not the way that AlphaGo, I mean, the, the system does it in the same and, system in the modern computer programs. Does that mean that Comey is too heavy? And Comey, for, for those that, that uh, are not familiar, Comey is, you know, uh, in in in, uh, in Go. Um, black it's, it's, the tempo. So black has to give a handicap back to white. Thank you. And it's uh, a point so handicap. Yeah. And so, and so that's 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 to make it more even. But uh, and and over time, it's. I mean, I mean, back in the Chinese days, it was there was no Comey. I don't want to go that back that far. But anyway, so it was it five even and a half. Even in ancient Japan, right? You're right. Take, talking about ancient history, right? I, I am. I am. I don't. I don't. That's a whole other. That's a whole other show. We're not going to go there. But but At my question. Is, but the related question is, you know, does that mean that that seven and a half is is too much? Uh, that seems to be the indication. Uh, so the valuations there work fairly well with Chinese rules, I guess, but it's, it's sort of difficult to see um, see it with Japanese rules. And I think that the computer valuation is easier to understand for the side that has an advantage. So like if white's percent winning percentage goes up from 50, 57% or something, if it starts at 57% and you see it go up to 60%, then you can be fairly sure that white has done something good and has gotten a, a bit of an advantage. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the, the black side, um, even if black does something that might give black a slight advantage, it's still going to be a losing game if you're evaluating it with seven and a half points sometimes. I see. And so sometimes um, black can be doing a valid strategy, but will not be um, getting anything out of it in the score. That, that's the way I see it. That, that's mm -hmm. my feeling about it. And so I find it more difficult to find good strategies for black uh, than I do for white. white. White, usually you can see the score going up. If you start with a, a score like 57% and you do something good, you can immediately see the score increase. Whereas um, if you start with 43% and you do something good, you probably just stay at 43%. Or actually, um, as the game progresses, your winning percentage can get worse and worse just because the game is getting closer to the end. So we'll just do one or two more questions before we wrap up. Uh, this is another one that, that we've talked uh, actually a lot of talking about. And you know, you're of course a professional Go player. You're you're competing. Folks can see uh, some of the commentaries that we've we've done on Michael's games against uh, other uh, human players. Um, can you talk just a little bit about how the how how's the culture and the professional uh, scene changed uh, now with the AI? You, you mentioned obviously uh, there's a bit of a generational gap with the younger players. Um, uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, players like myself who've been around a long time, uh, we have a lot of values that we've built into our game uh, with decades of study, and. Um, before computer programs came, these values gave us a huge advantage again, uh, compared to younger players who did not have the same experience. And we really need to spend a lot of time thinking about the game to develop these values that we have. Um, and so it takes decades for a top player to develop, to mature into um, a player who has this big advantage from the start of the game. And that, uh, the fact that that is being taken away <laughs> and like the younger players immediately have these very strong opening ideas given to them by computers. And in some cases, they actually learn it by memorization, uh, which is very much contrary to the, the idea of learning that I had when I was learning to play Go. Like it, memorization is the one thing that you don't want to do. In right. The old school. Um, and so uh, it's changed the way people study Go, and it has drastically it has, it, it speeded up the improvement of younger players. Mm -hmm. So it's giving them chances to beat top players almost immediately. Um, and it is the evaluation of positions that is so solid, it's so uh, reliable, the uh, evaluation, the score that the computer programs give to these positions is so reliable that 
um, a younger player can be confident that if he's within the variation that he's researched, uh, then he's supposed to be ahead. He's supposed to be having a good uh, position by following this computer generated, or sometimes it's generated together with the computer. Like mm. you can work together a professional human player and the computer to, to make a, a original variation sometimes. Mm -hmm. But you get a score there, which is fairly reliable. And so the player has a good idea of where he is. In a real game position where players don't have so much time maybe, um, and they're sort of winging it, that never happened. We, we were not so sure of where we were, how, how well we were doing until we had intensely studied the game afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that, that's giving the younger players a, a boost there. They're, they're, um, they're starting at a higher level and um, Naturally, younger players um, tend to be have better concentration. They're sharper, um, and so they they have an advantage in the tactical side. Right. And so, if they're boosted up in the positional ideas, uh, then they you can see a lot of younger players uh, coming up more quickly. So I think that's happening, and it's it's what makes it challenging for me uh, because I'm sort of old school there, um, but also very exciting to see all these new ideas coming up. Uh, one last uh, question, we're uh, wrapping up here, but uh, how has your own personal, your professional life changed, uh, you know, uh, since since AlphaGo? I guess it's been just four years. You're still competing professionally. You're still teaching. We've done a lot of videos. Um, just thoughts on, on, on your development? Well, my new definition of a professional is someone who refuses to give up. <laughs> 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 and so I'm just refusing to give up. Um, it has um, increased my motivation because I have all this study, I can generate all this new study material with computer programs. Mm -hmm. um, at the point before AlphaGo, I was having trouble trusting um, human pros because people have opinions. At that point, I was feeling that their opinions were not necessarily better than mine. And right. so I didn't really have a teacher to, to look up to. I think the fact that I have a computer program now that at least I know that the score it gives me, I, I trust that score to a certain extent and I can translate it when I have, when there's the, an issue with the Comey and it's different number, I have my own ideas about how I want to translate that score. It's something I can work with. Um, having that tool, which is working as a teacher for me, um, is a, a huge weapon that I have. It's a huge tool. and. It's um, increased my motivation, I think. Oh, I can absolutely attest to that. I mean, you, I mean you've always been wonderfully enthusiastic about the game. I mean, so many people uh, have come to it, you know, through, through you know, whether it's in person because you've traveled a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't want to go there, but you have done cruise ships, although you're probably going to be thinking twice about that at this point. Uh, but no, I mean, you've been out there, you've been in person, you, you've really... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of folks doing Go videos now, and that's a great thing. But, you know, you, you've you done them and you continue to do them. Um, but just back to the book, which was the whole purpose for, for doing this tonight, what I find really exciting, what was fun working with you on, on this book, was that it really is a different kind of Go book. There are no other Go books out there that have videos in them, that have color photos in them, that have, uh, I don't think, that have playable diagrams. Uh, and certainly, you know, uh, it gives you an ability to really offer a lot more. I mean, obviously, we always do your your SGF commentaries and uh, SGFs along with the with the Go commentaries. And those are all available either at usgo.org. Uh, Michael or uh, Stephen will put that up there, and also on our YouTube channel. Um, but what's nice about the book is that you really. It's kind of funny. You went really deep and generated all kinds of variations, and then you had to pair them. Not as far back as if you did a print version, but you did have to pair them back uh, for, for even for the ebook because you didn't want to have you know such a thicket. Um, and so you know your enthusiasm and ability to kind of you know communicate in in a, both a simple and a complex way uh, are really great. So the other thing I just want to say about the book is that I think you know there's something there are things in there even for folks that are you know new to the game. Uh, there's, there's, uh, each, each, uh, game has an introduction where we set the scene and there's photos. So we really wanted it to be, uh, attractive and sort of an entry level, even though there's, there's lots of commentary for the, 
the, the Go players out there uh, as well. So it's, it's, it's worth checking out. Uh, <clears throat> for those that are, that are just getting into the game, uh, you'll want to go to usgo.org. Uh, lots of good beginner material on there. Uh, find out where your local club is. Uh, it is certainly possible, you know, to play one of these AIs on your on your phone or on your uh, on your computer. But there's nothing beats uh, sitting down from another human being. Maybe at the moment, <laughs> given coronavirus, you know, online probably is safer at the moment. Uh, but uh, it's really, you know, I, I think you know one of the things that Michael and I love about this game. In the end, and 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 we we cannot end without a yet another. Uh, tip of the uh, of the hat to you know AlphaGo did not create itself. It was created by human beings. Amazing, uh, creative, brilliant human beings. We we had a you know a real opportunity to to have breakfast almost every day during the match with these folks, and it was just really fun. At the time, I didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they were very nice to explain things to us, but it was hard to understand sometimes. Yeah, but their their enthusiasm, just just like you know your enthusiasm for the game. I mean, sometimes when you're deep into a commentary and I'm trying to keep up with you, I'm not always sure I understand. But you know, I'm like Michael's excited. I'm along for the ride. And that's the way it was with with these folks from the Deep Mind team. They were just and also just really nice people, very very humble. Uh, really, they were they were so excited to sit down with you. And and I, I actually we have some wonderful photos that I took of you. You know, deep. Deep, you know, drawing out diagrams on paper napkins with the with the deep mind folks. So, uh, any just final thoughts before we wrap up? Yeah, well, I, when I went to the uh, to the match, I was I was sort of hoping they'd give me a copy of Alphago, and I'd take it <laughs> home, and then I'd have a huge advantage <laughs> in my tournament. It didn't happen, unfortunately. He yeah. kept. He kept, he, it's an inside joke because he kept saying that. Every time he'd see them, he'd ask them, can I get in the room? Can you give me a copy? And I think yeah. you you may have, actually, since you got Leela, you kind of backed off. Uh, you used to, in every single video, you know, you wanted a copy. But uh, I'm about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, Michael, I have to once again thank you. This has been wonderful. Uh, I, I really, I, I love the book. It's been so much fun working on it. This uh, I hope everybody enjoyed uh, our stream. Just a reminder, um, uh, we will pick up our schedule. Michael's been busy uh, with tournaments and travel, uh, but we have been doing, I think it was on Thursday, Thursday nights uh, for us, Friday mornings for you. Uh, I think we will be picking up that schedule. Uh, watch usgo.org, subscribe to the e-journal. We'll let you know when those start up. We generally also release those videos onto our YouTube channels on Friday nights. Um, as well. So if you don't catch it on the live stream, you can catch it on YouTube. Uh, yeah, and, I think we're in the zero, I uh, know it's the master series, master self play series. We're somewhere around game 36 or 7. Where, so, where, where, yeah. So we still have about 13, 14 games to go. Maybe by the end of the year, right? All right. I, I'm, I'm getting there. The, yeah. I'm so, ready to go. I, I, have, I have some files ready to annotate, to, right. to, I mean, to comment on. Uh, yeah. Once again, also just a thanks to to Anders, to Myron, to to Mike Samuel, uh, to all of our first readers who caught a lot of stuff and had a lot of su good suggestions. So uh, you know, any any of the errors are probably mine in the book. Michael is perfect, and and thanks to all the team there, uh, and also a huge thanks to Stephen who. Uh, which without Stephen, we would not be here on Twitch. He's a genius, and we really appreciate all his hard work and. Last but never least, uh, all of the wonderful folks at the American Go Association and the members uh, who make the AGA go, and of course, all of you watching. So thanks again, Michael. Thanks to all of you for watching, and we will see you next time.